Our speaker today is architect Jeff Bone. He's here um, as part of our environmental uh, programs and also as part of our World of Work series. He is most interested in the holistic interaction of architecture, landscape, and people. I spoke to him on the phone the other day and he told me a few very interesting things about his path to becoming an architect. His training did not start at Ball State University in Indiana, where he earned two degrees, one in environmental design and one in architecture. His training as an architect actually began when he was a little kid, growing up in Northwest Indiana. His dad was an architect who designed modernist homes. He designed one for his family using concrete, cedar, and glass. The whole family, mom, dad, and the kids, worked on building this house and lived in it while they were building it for five years. Now, tell me if I have this wrong, Jeff. This is what I wrote down, but um, I might have gotten it wrong. Um, the grown-up Jeff <laughs> lives now in uh, a, a home that's a work in progress, which was once a storefront beauty shop. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> and and he, you've been working on it for 25 years. Did I get that right? Still going. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I I wrote I wrote that down in my notes, and I'm like, could this be right? <laughs> Ask Mitzi that as well. <laughs> so we'll have to talk to Mitzi about that. Anyways, he now works with uh, a firm called Landon Bone Baker. And this firm believes that good design should be available to all. They work with nonprofit clients and communities to co-create inventive, inviting, and sustainable spaces that transform lives revitalize neighborhoods, and regenerate cities. He partners with unique nonprofits, including Archa Treasures, where architects collaborate with affordable housing residents to make art that becomes part of the architecture. Jeff's built work has received numerous awards, including multiple AIA Chicago Distinguished Building Awards, and four first place Richard H. Dry House Foundation Awards for Architectural Excellence in Community Design. Those of us of a certain age remember Cabrini Green and were not surprised when it was torn down. The structures themselves contributed to the terrible living conditions and the subsequent violence. Thankfully, the way that we look at affordable housing now is continuing to change. And it sounds like Jeff is part of that change and his firm. He will open our eyes to newer and better ways to think about designing affordable housing in our communities. Okay, Jeff. Thanks. <clears throat> Really, is that water around? Uh, yes, I think so. Oh, right here? Thanks. I think that's the first time I've ever opened a talk with a song. So <laughs> thank, I've not, never done that before. It was fun. Um, thanks so much for having me. Um, Sharon Applequist, um, I think over a year ago, asked if, if I'd be interested in doing this. And <laughs> it took a while, but... I'm here, and thanks so much for having me. Um, I think the, the idea, I mean, your values here um, are similar to our values uh, that um, we have with our architecture, which is human-centered, inclusive. Um, so I think um, what I've done, I'm notorious for showing a lot of images. I'm a visual guy, and I like to talk a little bit, but I like to show images more. So I've got a lot of images. Um, of our firm, a little bit about our firm, and then also a lot of the projects that we've done, and a bit about um, some of the great clients that we have um, in Chicago. Um, we, we do have the same good design as for everybody, and really what that means is that 
we work for people who don't have access to design. And I think we really believe in that so that we feel, you know, even things like paint colors, tile patterns, anything could be considered interesting and good design on all levels. And we want that to be available to everybody. We've got um, this map over here is we, we kind of keep track of all the projects that we do. And we're pretty lucky as architects because we most of our work is in, in the city and we work in lots of different neighborhoods. This is the loop kind of near north area. And as you can see, the orange dots are our projects, and most of them are not in the loop and in the near north. They're Humboldt Park, Uptown, Bronzeville, um, and some on the far south side in South Chicago. So we, we're pretty lucky we get to see lots of different parts of the city. Um, that's one of the things I really love about my work and job. Um, we also were committed to urban neighborhoods as a firm, and um, that means architecture and doing buildings, but it also means outreach. It means engaging with our clients um, and also providing education where we can, and we try and do all those things. Um, this is, I wanted to show this because architecture really is a team sport, and it's not, you know, <clears throat> individual. Has anybody read The Fountainhead, the book? I mean, that's so unrealistic. It's like, <laughs> um, really, architecture takes a whole team of people to do. And we've got a really great office. We're about 24 people. And we, we like that size because it's, um, it's small enough to still be fairly intimate. Um, but it's big enough that we could actually do some bigger projects. So I think we want to try and stay about this size. And also, um, all these things, <clears throat> we try as a group to really be engaged with our community. And these are some of the organizations um, we've taught at, at universities, um, and we're members and board members of different organizations around the city. And we try and kind of build on that as we go. <clears throat> what I want to do first, instead of jumping right into buildings, is talk about what we consider the stuff in between, which really is the outreach, the engagement, and educational aspects of, of the work that we do. Um, I think the buildings are a result of the process, but there is a long process. And usually it takes, and affordable housing projects can go on for five years. Um, and a lot of people change, a lot of different faces. So it's really important to try and keep the glue and the stuff there. We've, um, <clears throat> about five or six years ago, we started a, an educational component in our firm called the Lannabone Baker Labs. And really the, the goal of that was to bring in high school kids from around the city to engage in our projects. And we've, we've done various things like um, looking at indoor air quality um, for projects, things that relate to our buildings. Um, and one interesting thing that we're doing now is everybody familiar with the 606, the Bloomingdale? So we've got a client, uh, Lucha, and they've got a bunch of properties that they've had around the 606. And they're really interested in bicycles. And so, <laughs> They, they have a huge bike culture. They have a bunch of affordable housing units. So we studied um, with the students um, the bike cultures in, in their particular affordable housing buildings. And we were looking at fairly pragmatic things like storage and maintenance. But it's really interesting because there's a, a really big intergenerational bike culture that we didn't really know about that, that Lucha brought out. So we, um, what's really interesting about working with kids is that they're fearless for one thing, <clears throat> and also they can extract information that adults can't. You know, they can approach people differently. And so we get really interesting and, and cool information um, through that process that we can actually utilize. We also, um, we try and have interns in our office um, as much as possible. We usually have at least one, one per year. And a lot of the interns, um, like this guy, Juan, um, went on to become an architect. Uh, this was, you know, he's, I don't know, maybe 25 years old now. Um, but he's got a degree in architecture. So not every, everyone that works in the office becomes an architect. Um, but there's an interest in, in community. Um, and then we also, you know, on, on, the, on the child or the youth theme, we try and engage when there's opportunities. We do competitions, which are basically just kind of pro bono projects. And we worked um, with the school von Humboldt um, with the kids, a sixth grade class. 
And the goal was, it was a competition um, by Architecture for Humanity, and they were interested in, in, in kind of dreaming about what's the best classroom that we could have. So we said, well, let's, let's go to a school and engage with a, a real class. And so that was a total blast. Um, so this, um, we basically had a series of workshops where we sat down and just brought in the floor plan of the classroom, and the kids dove right in. And they had things like, you know, we want um, robots, we want, you know, chairs that roll around the classroom. And we actually took that literally. <laughs> and we designed um, furniture that kind of accommodated all these different possibilities. So this, this is a place to read a book. Underneath, you could work on your computer. There's bookcases. And we had a, a really good time. And also, this. All the kids were, were pretty amazing. Um, so I think, again, it keeps it fresh, the design process fresh for us to engage you know, um, youth. And we try and do that as much as possible. Another way that we engage communities is through public workshops and charrettes. And um, this is a project that we have been working on for years in South Chicago, um, down where the old steel mill used to be, um, way south, like 95th in the lake. And we go, we basically come in and, you know, the idea is that we, we're not trying to drop a plan onto a community, but we're trying to really understand what the assets are of the community kind of as it exists and then build on that. And the, the method that we do it is we, sorry, um, is we bring in plans and we really just sit around tables and brainstorm and kind of build on the brainstorming. And then we come back to the office and start to do three-dimensional drawings, basically incorporating some of the ideas and the comments that, that people had during, <clears throat> during the workshop. And a lot of times, the workshops are in really super interesting places, like bars. <laughs> and where, wherever you know, there's a community space. Um, this was a bar down in South Chicago called Long Cars that a lot of the guys that um, were working in the steel mills years ago um, used to go to, so it's got a real um, kind of specific history. We also are interested in, a, in our firm with green and energy efficiency, and I think the, the greenness and energy efficiency really pair well with affordable housing because the greener and more energy efficient you can make a building, the less it costs to operate. So that makes a lot of sense. So we've always been interested in, in that connection, <clears throat> and we do. Um, we come down and do more charrettes that are focused specifically on energy efficiency, recycling. Um, this is, we're looking at different light types, different fluorescent um, lights, and the different light quality that those provide. So a lot of this stuff is, is really kind of basic and grassroots, but I think it really feeds into the work that we do to kind of build and, and learn. Um, <clears throat> another um, way that we engage communities is through art. And we um, have been, as a firm, been working with this group, Architreasures, for about 30 years or so. And the goal of Architreasures really is to, is to create change through um, engaging students and community members in providing and, and doing public art. And <clears throat> we go into real, real projects. Um, this, again, was a project down on the south side. You can kind of see here, it's, a, it's an affordable housing project that has about 300 units. So there's just a lot of, lot of, um, lot of uh, housing right condensed in a certain area. And so we, we sit around with, with students and kids, the residents of, of the housing development, and brainstorm and come up with ideas. And again, those ideas are then translated into real plans. Um, it's really in the hands of the community members. The community members present their ideas. Um, this is an idea of, of treating kind of concrete, painting concrete, to kind of beautify some of the areas outside um, the fronts of their buildings. Um, and then they came, this group came up with a, a superhero that they painted that became the mascot for the development. Um, Germano man, and there was a Germano woman too. <laughs> that was eventually there. Um, and then these got these got positioned around the development. And um, the the owners of these affordable housing developments are super generous folks. So they provide the funding for these projects um, that are sustainable and have been going on for about 15 years. So really, without 
without that input, without that funding, a lot of this stuff wouldn't be able to happen. Um, we also, um, <clears throat> because we're interested in humans and how they interact with buildings, we're super interested in furniture. And we, um, we started a furniture company about 20 years ago called Knothead Furniture. Knothead is the cousin of Woody Woodpecker, so there's kind of a relation there. <laughs> Um, and one of our first um, jobs where we really paired furniture and architecture was a shelter um, for homeless teenagers that we did for the Night Ministry. Night Ministry is a nonprofit group in, in the city. And the build, this is the floor plan of the building. It was a really great Victorian building. It's on Clark near Belmont. And <clears throat> we didn't want to tear the building down, so we came up with this idea of, of designing furniture that could be inserted into the existing building to create these little semi-private spaces. And some of the residents then began to personalize everything. So we, this was 18-bed 18, 18 shelter, so we had 18 little semi-private spaces, these little armoires and bunk beds. Um, so we were able to preserve the existing building, which we really liked. Um, and then we, we got a little crazy. We started building the furniture in our office. We used to be in this old factory, and we had a space in the back um, which then developed into kind of a line of furniture out of plywood. And the goal was to keep it affordable um, and use kind of basic materials. Um, as you can see, the, the, there's a lot of dust generated by making furniture, and the dust didn't go too well with our computers. So we, had to, we, we stopped making the stuff in our office, and we ended up um, subbing it out to another shop. Um, but then we didn't really want to get in the business of furniture per se, so we kind of brought it back into um, thinking of furniture as kind of part of the architecture. So now, Knothead Furniture really is, is really about making things, bunk beds, um, you know, cabinets, um, storage areas for daycare, really kind of inserting those into the buildings instead of thinking it as individual stuff. Um, now, I've got a bunch. We have, uh, as a firm, let's see, we've probably got maybe 30 or so jobs going kind of simultaneously, all in different phases. And we, you know, the reason that we're able to do good work is because we have great clients. And a lot of our clients, there's nonprofits that we work for, there's developers of affordable housing, uh, we work for the Chicago Housing Authority. So there's lots of different kind of um, client relationships that we have. Um, merely mentioned Cabrini. We're actually involved in um, some of the new housing that's being built at Cabrini. This building um, just finished up about six months ago. It's on division. As you can see, this was the old Cabrini. Um, you know, the, the goal now with the, C, with the CHA is to provide mixed income housing. So this building is a mixed income development, which will be one third Section 8 subsidized housing one-third affordable housing, and then one-third of the units are market rate units. Um, so they're market prices. Um, and those are, there's about 100 units in this building. And then the ground floor is supportive services. There's counseling and management and things like that. Um, <clears throat> we used one of our um, LBVA lab summers with kids. Uh, we used to kind of start to understand the relationship between the sidewalk and the building. And so the kids went out with, with boards and they just stood on the corner and just started talking to people. <laughs> and it actually worked. I mean, they got some really interesting ideas about what people thought about the sidewalk in relationship to the building and just the pedestrian view of the building. <clears throat> um, we've also, we do a lot of rehab as well. And we really believe in preserving existing buildings um, and not necessarily going to tear right, right away tearing things down. So this was a, an old CHA property um, down in Greater Grand Crossing. And it's been, it, was a, it was a joint venture with Theaster Gates. I don't know if anybody's heard of Theaster. He's doing a lot of super interesting things down on the south side. But this was uh, really pairing the idea of, of affordable housing and artists. And we preserved <clears throat> 30, 36 units this was an existing CHA um, project that was built in the 70s, which we preserved. We took away a piece of it and inserted this community art 
piece, which we call the front porch. And the front porch then is really, it's kind of a community center. And so that really is part of this complex. And we rehabbed the units. Um, we opened up, took out some of the floor to create some two-story space and provide some opportunities for artwork um, hanging. And <clears throat> really, um, the 36 units of housing and then this new front porch where there's some wood shops. There's all, they really program it well. Um, Theaster's Rebuild Foundation is a pretty amazing organization. They've also done that Stony Island Bank. Has anybody seen that on Stony Island? It's, it's a great place. Um, and then also we spent a lot of time with the exterior, with the garden space, to really provide this kind of naturalistic um, gardening place for kids to play. There's some uh, shots of, of uh, like a Saturday. They do, they do yoga, they do music, they do all kinds of stuff in this big space. And it's really cool because at night it's, um, we designed it to be all glass and very transparent, so at night it really becomes like a beacon in the neighborhood. And the neighborhood is is in transition, so it really is, is a kind of a stark contrast, and it really symbolizes kind of the things to come. One of our um, <clears throat> longtime clients is a group called La Casa Norte. They're um, in Humboldt Park, and their mission really is to help homeless teenagers, and they're kind of expanding into supporting families as well. Um, a number of years ago, the, a project that we did with them was a um, a shelter for homeless teenage boys. And they, back then, um, this is on North Avenue. This was the existing building. Their goal was to be kind of low key, and they wanted to be kind of in the background um, as a place and a building. So we really, we really picked up and kind of rehabbed the existing masonry. We inserted this new, more modernistic storefront, but the building was intended to be kind of low key, because I think. <clears throat> they felt at the time that the population, you know, the kids, there was a lot of issues with, um, with parents and things, and they just wanted it to be, they didn't want to draw attention to themselves. So we really focused on, on the interior. So the, the <clears throat> street facade was pretty low key, and you come, you come inside, and we spent a lot of time, um, we worked in a pretty grassroots way. We did a lot of hand sketches. Um, where we'd sit down around a table and just kick around ideas about colors, about materials. How could we make the space warm for the, for the homeless kids? You know, I think the idea of home was super important to La Casa Norte. Um, we had a design then on the ground floor, which is all public space, that really focused around a common kitchen. So all the kids, there's 16 beds, would come and they'd prepare meals together. Um, <clears throat> we have a thing... Um, called a punch list, which is after the project is done, architects come in and we, we basically look for all the, the flaws. And we were showing up for that one day, and, and this, this kid, Anthony, was, who was the first resident of, of the shelter, came down all excited. He had just an arm full of these high-rise models. It's like, what is going on? And he, he lined them up. He kind of set them up on the kitchen island. And he basically was really proud of these. And it turns out that he has, he has no architectural education, but he, there's a, a website called skyscraper.com. He basically went on the website and started constructing the city of Chicago on his own. <laughs> and it was so perfect that this was the first resident. And <clears throat> so the rooms um, are very tiny. We kind of we design rooms that to get as many as possible in the building. They were the absolute code minimum, so they were like 72 square feet. And we treated. We had this idea that we wanted to get the sleeping area off the ground. So this is like a college bunk bed. Probably everybody's had one of these at any time. And then there's a work area underneath and some storage. So for Anthony, it was perfect because it provided him this little studio space. And then he could work on his models. And actually, this is a really clean shot. I mean, by the time um, we left the project, literally this whole room was full of skyscrapers. And he had, re he had, started, he had finished Chicago, and he started on LA. <laughs> so, so it was really cool. He's, he's from LA. And we, um, Anthony had a lot of issues. He, he worked in the office, in our office, for a while we, to build some models. And then. Um, one day he just disappeared, so we're not sure where, 
where he went. Um, but he was, he's a really good kid. Um, also, at, with La Casa Norte at that same project, we worked uh, um, with architectures to do a piece of art, <clears throat> collaborative art, um, with, the, with the kids there, some of the first kids that were staying there. And they'd, they wanted to build a bench in the backyard, but the bench was adorned with this kind of crazy tile wall, um, looking at things like wisdom, brotherhood, and leadership, you know, really thinking about some of the things that they needed to kind of take the next step you know, once they get out of the, out of the shelter. The shelter um, was really meant to be transitional housing, so they were, could be there for nine months, and then the idea is that they would get into some kind of school or work program, and then into a more stable housing situation. Um, <clears throat> part of the, the really fun part about affordable housing and working with nonprofits is, is really the people that you get to meet. And there's always a party at the end of a project and with a ribbon cutting. And this is an example of, of the people getting together um, after the La Casa Norte project. And these two guys, Keith Decker and uh, Mr. McQueen, they were both street ministers that worked at the night ministry. And they bought the building for La Casa Norte and basically gave it to them, which kicked off their whole project. So a couple of pretty good guys. Um, we have long relationships with our clients, and a lot of times we'll do multiple projects. And so La Casa Norte has, is dreaming bigger. And so we jumped in, after we finished the shelter, into a project which they're calling a comprehensive community center, which is a highly dense mixed-use building that has 25 units of affordable housing, it has La Casa Norte's um, offices on an entire floor. It has a cafe. It has a teen center, a teaching kitchen, um, emergency showers. It's like almost everything you can imagine is packed into this building. And we started, a lot of times, um, the way that we start these projects is we have community meetings. And um, you can see this was back in 2011. <laughs> the job will go into construction this summer, so it's a long process. <clears throat> and a lot of times they, they're really grassroots. They happen in churches in the neighborhoods. This happened to be a church right down, right down the street from the site. And we go in and we have very conceptual plans and we just start a dialogue. We present the ideas and get feedback from the community. Um, there's always concerns that we have to talk about you know, and kind of work through the process. Um, the site is, is an old industrial building. They used to make um, screws there. And we tried to, we looked at saving the building, but we couldn't do it. Um, so we, we are going to demolish the building, which has already happened, <clears throat> and provide this new comprehensive community center uh, with the youth drop in. This is, um, I'm not sure if everybody's kind of familiar with reading floor plans at all, but this is a floor plan of the ground floor. Here's the main entry, which is right here. So you come into this big lobby, there's a teen center here. There's a clinic that's going to be run by Howard Brown in the back. Um, there's a food pantry and a teaching kitchen all on the ground floor. And then here, you kind of sneak in to an elevator, and this takes you up to the top three floors where all the residential units are. This is a model. We do a lot of models. We used to do things by hand. Now, this, this model was, all, was built with a laser. It was laser cut, so we do it in, on the computer, and then... It comes as flat pieces, and then it's assembled. But the building, you can see, it kind of steps back, and then it's got a big donut hole kind of in the middle, which provides light and ventilation for all the units. That's the exterior. And it's really interesting. So as I mentioned earlier, the original shelter, La Casa Norte, wanted to be low key with the building. They've kind of flipped now, and now they want something that really is energized and kind of brings attention to themselves. And so we've designed something that has lots of glass so you can see what's happening on the inside. Glass on the ground floor, the cafe is here, um, some green roof decks, and then a lot of sustainability. This is a, imagine kind of a section or a cut right through the middle of the building. You can see the center is a green roof um, which opens up for the residential units to get light but it also provides a way to get light through skylights down onto the second floor of the office space. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be a lead silver, which is a 
pretty highly um, efficient building, energy efficient. And we've got a whole host of green, um, green elements. Bike storage, courtyards, green roof. And we, we work a lot in 3D renderings, and these are kind of in progress with how we kind of imagine the interior of these buildings, what kind of materials that we're using. This is a shot from the teen center. We've got a little stage for music, um, some lockers for the kids, and then these kind of operable glass doors that kind of open up the whole ground floor so you can really have some big events. Um, <clears throat> another building type that we're really interested in and that we've worked on for a lot of years is SRO, which is a single room occupancy building. And those, a lot of those were, were built back in the 20s and they're, they're all over the city. And there, there's a real danger now that those are being bought up by market rate developers and taken offline for affordable housing. It's one of the kind of lowest forms. I mean, the kind of from like a tent. I mean, if somebody's living in one of the SRO units, I mean, it's really great to get off the street. They're very affordable. Um, but again, the you know property in the city is in demand, and some of these are on the north side and in uptown are being bought. So I think we've been working with um, <clears throat> groups like One North Side, uh, the Heartland Alliance, and Enterprise um, to formulate ways to allow affordable housing developers to buy these buildings and keep them as affordable housing and rehab them. So we've had a series of workshops and charrettes. Um, one of, an example is, is a, a project called Harvest Commons. And this was a, a joint venture with Heartland Alliance, um, First Baptist, and um, some other groups. Um, Heartland Alliance is a really great group. They have um, lots of different aspects. Housing is one um, we engage with them on the housing aspect. And they're really progressive in terms of um, pairing sustainability, urban agriculture to create supportive housing. <clears throat> we took this, um, this building, which was called the Viceroy Hotel, which was built in the 20s. It's a gorgeous building. It was built in 1928. It's on the historic register now and um, developed the plan. It's on the near west side. Um, this is Madison Avenue and Ashland right here. Here's Union Park. So it's a very prominent corner right here. You can see it from the park. It kind of has this view over the park. Um, it's got, you know, SROs have had a lot of bad rap over the years. <laughs> and this was taken from the Chicago Defender in the 1960s. So it was $3, transients welcome, and um, free adult films, you know, things like that. So. I think that you know they started out as residential hotels um, from people that come in from like Iowa and basically to live and they work in the loop. And over the years, they're really on Madison Avenue kind of went down. So this has really been a rebirth. It's the project goals were to really create a vibrant community, smart sustainability, and healthy living, kind of pairing those three things. The main the target resident is. Um, folks who are homeless or at risk of being homeless. And um, looking at the Chicago area median, um, funding 60% to 30% of the American or the median income, um, which is about somebody, for a single person, somebody makes about $15,000 a year. Um, and 60% of area median income is somebody who makes about 30,000. So it's fairly, fairly low income. Um, a lot of these folks are working in the service sector and restaurants and grocery stores and things like that. <clears throat> um, we have a whole host of, of supportive services. Um, we've got a, this garden, which is an urban farm on the corner. Um, we've got room for composting. We've got an on-site chicken coop um, for the residents. Um, the building is a super green building. Um, it's got a, a 13 well geothermal system, and that really helps for the heating and air conditioning. There are wells that go down 600 feet, um, a green roof, and also a solar system providing um, solar hot water for the building. Um, and also then there's, there's um, 89 units of small affordable housing. Um, one floor is taken up by St. Leonard's Ministries uh, for women. And then there's um, a, a cafe Gracie's Cafe, which is run by St. Leonard's um, Social Enterprise Cafe. 
Now, these units are, are very small. Uh, the SRO, they're about 275 square feet. So that's really enough room for a bed, a nice little kitchenette, um, some closet space, and a nice bathroom. So everybody gets their own bathroom, everybody gets their own kitchen. Um, and this particular building has great windows and great views. So it really is, it, it's nice accommodations. This, this is the condition. Unfortunately, a lot of these buildings have been ransacked over the years. So when we first walked into the building, to start to understand what we were doing, we ran into this. And the radiators were stolen and kind of rolled down the stairways for salvage, and everything was taken out of the building that was worth anything. Um, but in the end, the building then is transformed into these, these units that residents move into. Um, it's really great. There's room for personalization. They bring pictures. This is the building, um, the main facade. Um, it's a terracotta facade, which Chicago, back in the day, was really big in terracotta. This was done by the Northwest Terracotta Company um, back in the 20s. And it was pretty unusual to have a, a colored building. Most buildings were just gray or brick. And so this building really stood out. A lot of this detail, I don't have any close-ups, but it's phenomenal, the amount of detail on this building. So this was all preserved and restored. The building now, as I mentioned, is on the National Historic Register of Places. Um, this is a view from the roof looking down at the, this was right before the urban garden um, started getting planted. We've got a little uh, pavilion, this little butterfly pavilion, a lot of an edible orchard. We've got five different apple trees here that the residents can just pick apples and eat. And then the cool thing about this is there's a teaching kitchen um, in the building, on the ground floor of the building that faces the garden. So there's this kind of connection with food and health and then teaching the residents how to prepare their food, healthy food. And there's been some health, Heartland is in the middle of doing some health studies. So there's some really positive metrics um, with um, health and food in terms of visits to the emergency rooms are going down and some real, real benefits. <clears throat> um, Part of the, the fun part of this is we got to tour some urban farms around the city. Um, we looked at a lot of things, um, growing home as an organization, the plant down in back of the yards. So There's some really interesting things happening in the city. And then we also went into Logan Square, and there's all these kind of mini urban farms in Logan Square, <laughs> people raising chickens. So we talked to a lot of the residents and families about you know, the pros and cons and how to design a chicken coop, <laughs> which we did. So we designed a chicken coop for, for 10 chickens. Um, we kind of made it funky um, with some kind of different roof shapes. And it was, it was brought in on a flatbed truck and craned in and kind of dropped onto the site. And then <clears throat> loaded full of chickens, and they're still there today. I think they, get, they probably get like eight or nine eggs per day. And the residents then take those, and they can take them personally or cook them as a group or whatever they want to do. Um, Another thing, Heartland is very progressive. They hired this guy, Farmer Dave. He's an urban farmer. And basically, he works with the residents to pick the crops um, in the wintertime. And then they get all the seeds. And then in the spring, they all plant together. So this is um, in the community room. They're picking, picking the plants for next year. This is out in the, here's the building. Here's that little pavilion. And then the urban farm harvesting in the fall. It's Farmer Dave. <laughs> and then another really interesting part, the, the social enterprise cafe, Gracie's, is really intended to have residents who live in the building be able to work in this cafe in the bottom of the building. And it's a year program, so they go through this training cycle, and then they end up working in Mariano's, Whole Foods, different places around the city. So um, St. Leonard's is a really great organization. And then we also... <laughs> We packed a lot into this one. This was a really fun project. We worked with Arca Treasures and this artist, Bernard Williams, and did a number of workshops and developed some public art um, with the residents and actually built a bunch of models. And a lot of the residents had these great stories. And, and Bernard took the, um, everything that was developed in those workshops and kind of made it, made it into a sculpture, a steel sculpture that was installed on the corner of the site. We had a great 
opening, Alderman Burnett was there, um, First Baptist, and then we had food that was prepared from the garden. And we had some music too. These are a couple of local musicians, little fiddle player. And um, just hung out, had, had food, and it was nice. <clears throat> So that, that's kind of a more intimate scale. We also do kind of neighborhood redevelopment. And we've worked a lot for 20 years or so in, in the Roseland neighborhood, which is like 105th in South Michigan, um, with a group called Neighborhood Housing Services. And we've done about 150 units of housing. And really, the, it's a long-term vision um, for the community. And it, it's comprised of many different types of housing. <clears throat> this is the neighborhood. Um, it hadn't had any new development since probably in the 50s, Roseland. So um, working class neighborhood, but really, really interesting neighborhood. A lot of nice Chicago bungalows. So we first started out doing, um, the city of Chicago had a, a housing program focused for um, workforce housing. Basically, they wanted to keep police officers, teachers, public workers in the city. So. Um, it was called New Homes for Chicago. So we, we built a bunch of um, single-family homes, three-bedroom single-family homes on vacant lots. And the area was really, really pretty tough. And working with NHS and the community created some block clubs and really got things back up and running. Then we also did a, they had a need, a need for housing for single mothers in the neighborhood as well. So we developed a 40-unit townhouse development for single moms and their kids. And the idea was to basically create this protected garden in the back. And the kitchens were in the back of the house, so the moms could be preparing food and in the kitchen, but also see their kids playing in the backyard. <clears throat> and then it culminated into the whole idea really was to allow the residents of Roseland to stay in the neighborhood. And a lot, of, a lot of seniors are living in the neighborhood that grew up in Roseland, and there was no senior housing. Um, so the next phase was to develop um, a, an independent living senior, affordable senior building, and then a smaller building, which was grandparents raising grandkids, which was a real need in that neighborhood as well. This, this building, the senior building, has a city of Chicago senior satellite in the ground floor, floor, which was the first kind of pairing of those with senior housing um, with HUD. And so there's a lot of activity in there. This, this big garden in the front was, uh, were some of the goals with that. That's the senior building. And again, I, there's a real neighborhood pride with these projects. And so um, Debbie Dixon was our client, and she wanted to have this cornerstone laid wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And we set that as during the construction process. And there's representatives from HUD, um, the Alderman, City of Chicago. The Senior Center has some great yoga and dancing for the seniors. <laughs> I think this was like Western line dancing or something. <laughs> and you can see um, there's a lot of glass. So you're looking back through, through the courtyard to the Grandparents Raising Grandkids building over here, which is that building. One funny story, one thing they didn't plan on, so HUD has this regulation that to apply for this building, you have to be 62 or over to be a grandparent. Most of the grandparents in Roseland are in their 40s. So that was something they totally missed. So it was really difficult to actually rent this building up, which was really sad. Um, but they worked it out with HUD and were able to get um, some slight variations to those rules. And then again, the, the celebrations. This, was, this building completed um, when Daly was actually not in office, but he came back to the, to the ribbon cutting and gave a speech. And then this guy, Eddie, who was a senior that moved into the, into the building had lived in Roseland neighborhood all his life. So he came back and has, how am I doing with time? Am I over already? Five more minutes. Okay, I'll rush through it. Um, so a couple, a couple other things. I think I have way too many slides, but <laughs> I warned you. Um, so we also do buildings that support community. So non-housing buildings, but usually they're buildings that have some kind of educational component. This is one we're just finishing up. It's called Shy Cat. And it's a project that is in the Illinois Medical District. And they're 
program really looks at sector-driven vocational training for adults, arts and technology for youth. And it's part, it's the 10th affiliate of a national center for arts and technology that started in Pittsburgh by this guy, Bill Strickland. And again, we had a huge charrette um, in North Lawndale where there was probably 100 people providing feedback. We looked at topics like security, interiors, exterior aesthetics, community spaces. Um, there are youth, it's multi-generational, got a lot of good feedback. And then we go back and we start to design the spaces. The building's an old, it's a repurposed industrial building that was built in the 20s. There's digital labs. Bill Strickland, you should look this guy up. He's phenomenal. He was a MacArthur genius. Um, he was awarded the grant. And he has basically, he has some pretty simple ideas about, um, about people, that everybody's an asset, environment shapes behavior, and creativity fuels enterprise. And he basically says if you have good food, a good space with natural light, and you nurture people, that's, you've got most of it covered right there. So those are his goals. And we had an opening, um, I think, 22nd. That was Wednesday. And we opened the building, and there was like 800 people who turned out. It's kind of a cool site. It's right by the pink line. So the train is a presence. It's kind of tucked in there. This is the main entry. They've got these amazing digital labs with 3D printing, desktop um, printing. Um, these are some of the, the people looking at these, printing these little octopus things. <laughs> They've got computer labs. Um, this was all funded by one guy, Steve Sarowitz, who made a lot of money by selling his company Paylocity. And he basically wanted to give, give back to the community, so he hooked up with Shy Cat. Um, they had Shy Arts, these high school jazz musicians, at the, at the opening, and they were playing some really great, great music. That's the, the main room. It was packed. It was just fantastic. And then finally, um, tiny houses are like a big deal these days. And the city of Chicago are really interested in tiny houses. And we're interested in tiny houses from an affordability standpoint. Um, we've been interested in tiny living in, in, and understanding how small you can get just to keep things affordable. Um, but also incorporating local resident employment, um, insulation and really the grassroots thing to energy efficiency. We've developed, we've designed a little pocket tiny homes community down on the south side. There's about 12 tiny homes with a little community center. The, the average cost of a new affordable housing unit to build conventionally is like $350,000. And we think that we can build tiny homes for about 80,000 per unit. So I think there's, there's a lot of savings kind of built into it. Um, and then there's also a real flexible vision with who tiny homes could be good for. There's affinity communities for artists, gardeners, there's seniors, there's empty nesters, there's students, there's a lot of possibilities. Here's an image. This one, we're, we're envisioning this kind of community around the garden, the little tiny homes here. This is a floor plan of the tiny home, so it really is one big room with a kitchen and a bathroom and furniture that kind of opens and closes and folds out. They're about 325 square feet. There's been a competition um, for a tiny home uh, that the University of Illinois put on. They built one. We're looking at tiny homes in conjunction with maker communities on the south side with community kitchens. And then finally, we're doing a real a large-scale tiny homes campus with Easter seals and thresholds for like about 120 units of, of housing, um, a tiny house community and a bigger building with small units with an urban farm. And it's all about the people. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>「What is a charrette?」What's a charrette? I should have explained that. It's, it basically is a, a brainstorming session that you do fast. And so you come in and you have a, a basic outline or a list of topics and you have um, things to draw with, tracing paper, and you let 
kind of set no limits on it, and you basically just have a discussion or dialogue about certain topics. It could be a building, it could be you know security, art, you know, just what people want to see. And we participate and facilitate charrettes as a way to engage our clients and community to get a kind of bigger picture about the buildings and communities that we're doing. And it's fun. It's super fun. And usually it works best when there's there's kids and you know a whole range of of ages because the kids really loosen it up. You know, they keep us honest. <laughs> I have a question here. Uh, okay, that sounds too loud. I'll hold it right here. Um, so uh, the project that you, where there was that interior square light well, mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, could you decide, decide, huh, describe the design process and uh, were there iterations uh, along the way and then? Yeah. Uh, I, so, I mean, to me, it looks fabulous, but I just wonder, when you're done with a project, uh, do you ever feel that, oh, maybe we could have uh, changed something here or there? Uh, pardon me for asking that, but... No, 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 that's, that's a great question. That's why I've been working on my house for 25 years. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think, yeah, there's many iterations. And <clears throat> one interesting story about that project was that we came our first pass at that building was something a lot more rational and um, more cost effective. And <clears throat> our client, Sol Flores, who's um, really driven and intense, she's the head of La Casa Norte, said that she was interested, she didn't like the idea that everything was the same and she wanted everything to be unique. And so by punching that hole kind of in the middle, and kind of radiating the units around it, it, it created weird shapes. And she liked the idea that there were, there were different shapes and that somebody could have a unit that wasn't like somebody else's. So it took us lots of iterations. I mean, this process, I mean, I, like I was saying, we started in 2011 and now we're in for permit. We're trying to get a building permit now. And so what is that? That's seven years, six years. And I, the thing that is hard, though, is that over the period of five or six years, I look at that original design, and I probably would do it differently today. <laughs> so that's really, but a building costs a lot, so you can't really do that. You know, you have to, you have to like, commit to a solution. And then, yeah. Yeah, and then we we hired a general contractor and the price came in too high. <clears throat> so we had, there's a process that we work through, it's called value engineering, where we basically look at ways to make things cost less. And we some of those things can be design changes. Like that building was designed as a concrete frame building because, and it was designed at the time when the, kind of financial meltdown was happening. So the price of concrete, there wasn't much construction and concrete going on around the city. Now the whole city's bursting with construction. So the cost of that concrete structural frame like quadrupled. So we had to, we had to redesign the building as a steel frame building, which saved like a million dollars. So, you know, it's... I had the privilege of going through Harvest Commons soon after oh. it opened as part of the Open House Chicago process. Oh, great. And John told me that some of your <clears throat> Dorchester Arts and some of the other centers would be perfect if you can get them onto the list for next fall. Yeah. Um, but I have a, an adult son who's severely handicapped, developmentally disabled, and he's been on the list for supportive housing for years. And of course the state, as many of you know, has gone towards a model, you know, get them out of the institutions and move them into small houses, group homes in the community where they'll be supposedly integrated with their normal peers, and the state won't fund anything more than about four or six bedrooms or beds <clears throat> per unit. And many parents and organizations that serve the disabled have been frustrated by this because it's not cost effective. They're not adding beds fast enough to accommodate the need because nobody can make the numbers work 
with four or six clients per unit, right? Mm -hmm. So many of the things that I saw at Harvest, yeah, here it comes. Many of the services and the, the layout at Harvest Commons and at that uh, Casa Norte place on North Avenue for the homeless teen boys, um, these are all perfect models, mm -hmm. perfect design for developmentally disabled people where you can have the supportive services on the first floor, the little mm -hmm. cafe where they can work, the kitchen where they can all learn about nutrition, yada, yada. Yeah. And I'm wondering, since the parents and the social service kinds of folks don't seem to be getting anywhere, maybe they are, is the architectural, prof there is a question, is the <laughs> architectural profession now, or could they potentially be a force for good to lobby the state that maybe big institutions with 600 people are bad, but some of these 80, 90 unit things are the only way to move forward and get these hundreds and hundreds of people who have been on waiting lists for decades off the list and into a 62 square foot unit of their own with nursing and counseling and whatnot on the first floor and community projects and whatnot. Thank you. You know, the, the last thing I showed, which was a, a project that we're working on with um, Easter Seals and Thresholds is an amazing organization who has lots of units around the city. And on a policy level, they're constantly engaging Washington and the state for some of the Right. And then Easter Seals is autistic youth and adults. And I just think that as architects, we were part of the team. I mean, I don't think that architects necessarily have enough pull, um, but groups like the American Institute of Architects are starting to come around. You know, architecture is a funny profession because like the social impact stuff that we do hasn't always been of interest to architects. And it's becoming more, as with the millennials, there's this new generation of youth and young people coming up, and they're interested in this stuff. So I think that <clears throat> it's, it's going to get a lot better. And I think that the AIA, some of the organizations that do have some muscle that way, are starting to slowly come around with this and really focus on diversity, social enterprise stuff. And I think that on the architectural side, that in the future is going to be strong, but we've got a lot of work to do. Hey, yeah. I'm over here to your left. Hi. <laughs> Thanks so much for your presentation. I um, have a question that has sort of two halves that are related, which is when I look at these new spaces, and I, I live up like the center of Halstead when it was built. If you walk into that space, it's, be it's pretty new, shiny public space that created a community. Um, and I always worry, what's it going to look like in five years or 10 years or 15 years? Do people know how to maintain those surfaces? Do people keep those computers working? Does the 3D printer actually work next year? And are there resources to make those cool programming things actually work next year and five years from now? And those exteriors, like we all drive around and we say, oh, that was a 70s building. That was a mistake. That was 1968. Nothing was going well in architecture. And how do you think about how is that building going to look in 10 or 15 or 30 years? Um, is it going to look like a bad moment in architecture or a very specific moment in architecture <laughs> that doesn't serve the community well? Or how do we, is that even your burden to bear? Like, I'm just, like, how do these things age, both inside and outside? That's a tough question. Well, I think, you know, sustainability in terms of, you know, maintaining buildings is something we think about a lot. And, when we design buildings, we want to design buildings that have materials that are sustainable, that keep up and uh, kind of work with, uh, with our clients. And I think that we can go so far in specifying those materials and having conversations about them, but ultimately to have an owner of a building needs to engage and make sure that they're aware that, you know, you can't just design a building, move in, and just think that it's going to last that you know, we, our goal is to design spaces that are flexible, that have some flexibility for change in the future. Um, that Shycat project was, you know, we have a lot of the floors that are raised, so there's flexibility with wiring for technologies. Um, I think the furniture, kind of building furniture for spaces, allows a certain flexibility. You can have a very simple room, and then the furniture becomes the thing that changes kind of within that. Um, I think that, um, you know, the CHA, I mean, that's an example of things going wrong in terms of building housing and then not maintaining those high-rises. I mean, our firm feels like they should have never tore the high-rises down, that they could have repurposed those buildings. 
um, and made them better. And that, you know, there's a lot of question about management and how it relates to, you know, how those buildings were upkept and everything. So I, I think, and then also, I think just in terms of the aesthetics, I mean, I know what you're saying, like, you know, it's like, oh, that's, you know, CHA did a lot of scattered site housing in the 90s, and you can tell those buildings around the city because they used a certain type of brick. It's the orange brick, and it's like, that's what we, don't want to recreate that kind of situation. So we really try and look at the context of where we're building the buildings to try and relate somehow. But also, our clients are interested in, in being designed forward. They, want to, they look at design as a way to kind of separate themselves. So I think they have energized, you know, Center on Halstead's a really cool building. And I think that that really, people know that building for the architecture to a certain extent, and also their mission. So it's really combining the mission and letting the buildings kind of express the kind of personalities of the clients. Th thinking about a different kind of tiny housing than you were talking about a little bit ago, uh, have um, you ever explored the feasibility of trying to acquire existing SRO buildings and, and rehabbing them uh, and or uh, acquiring larger uh, residential buildings that perhaps uh, remodel uh, the interiors into uh, that type of unit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I think what we're, we're uh, trying to address housing on all fronts. And <clears throat> rehab, I think when rehab is affordable and it makes sense, we certainly do that. I mean, a lot of the, we've, we're working on some SRO projects now where they're rehabs. We've probably done maybe 10 of those buildings over the years. And it's, it's kind of one prong of the housing issue. And I think that rehab, um, the, the funny thing is, is you would think that you would be able to save money by rehabbing a building because there's a lot of it that's already built. And actually rehabs tend to be more expensive than new buildings. <clears throat> just because there's a lot of messing around, there's lots of repairs. Um, so that, that's something that we found. And I think that we try and do a cost-benefit analysis early on. Um, but to, to your point about, you know, probably repurposing other types of buildings like factories or schools, we're looking at a bunch of schools um, that the mayor closed <laughs> and trying to figure out ways to make housing out of those. And actually a classroom size works really well for putting in a residential unit. So we've got some two or three schools that we're looking at, CPS schools, um, one on the south side, one on the west side, that we're doing maybe 80 or 90 residential units with supportive services. Okay, those this will be our last question. Okay. Um, but Jeff is going to stay for our coffee hour, so you'll have plenty of time to speak with him about this, this uh, about his work, which um, is, this has been such an engaging program. Do you ever get to the people who need the affordable housing involved in the physical processes of building and upkeeping the housing? You mean like owning it? Working with oh, work. construction. That, that's what you're yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've had some experience with that. It's something that's <clears throat> with affordable housing. <clears throat> it gets tricky because there are certain there are a lot of strings attached to the funding that come with affordable housing in terms of of how much you have to pay people who work on the buildings. But one of the ways that we allow people to kind of have a hand in creating their own spaces is through that group architectures where they they can do artwork and things that kind of plug into the building that they have a hand in making. Some of the tiny houses that we're looking at, we feel like those buildings could be built by residents and we're we're looking at that as an option because they're smaller and we could actually use the tiny homes as like an educational to train people on how to um, construction jobs and various things like that. So that's something we're actively looking at at the moment. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Great